Well, good evening. My name is Bill Purcell, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and it's my very special privilege to welcome each and every one of you here to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. The Institute of Politics was established in 1966 as a living memorial to President John F. Kennedy. And from our beginnings in this building, we've gathered in this space for very special events, bringing to the students and the people of this college, this university, and this community uh, those things and thoughts, ideas, and individuals who we believe and historically have accomplished need to be brought to you at that time. We're joined here tonight by our Dean David Elwood, and as he has made so clear from the beginning of this new school year, we are particularly uh, focused on the fact that two weeks ago, uh, today, uh, our senator, Senator Edward M. Kennedy, uh, was lost to us, a leader, a man who was uh, a part of this institute throughout most of our history, stood on this stage many times, and an individual who both uh, as an inspiration to us and as a leader, I think, would have said that this particular night uh, is especially the kind of night that should occur here, bringing us all together early in a year uh, for a panel that is tonight entitled, Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? We're going to explore tonight competing ideas of justice that lie beneath the surface of, uh, and maybe not that far beneath the surface, of many of the most hotly contested political debates and ideas of our time. This discussion will be largely based uh, on the undergraduate course, Justice, taught by this evening's moderator, Professor Michael Sandel. Uh, justice has enrolled, the course Justice, has enrolled over 14,000 students through the years, making it one of the most popular courses in Harvard history. The course has been so successful that Professor Sandel is publishing a book, and PBS has created a television series that will begin on September the 20th and then proceed in 12 parts. The book itself will be available later this month, and since the course will not be offered this year at Harvard, for some of you this may be all of the justice that you'll get. <laughs> Professor Michael Sandel is formerly the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University, where he's taught political philosophy since 1980. Prior to this book, he authored four other books on political philosophy, ethics, and justice, which are available in 11 languages. He was the recipient of the Harvard Radcliffe Phi Beta Kappa Teaching Prize, and in 2008, he was recognized by the American Political Science Association for a career of excellence in teaching. We're especially pleased that Professor Sandel will be joined tonight by such a distinguished panel. Uh, uh, colleagues of his, and one particularly, I think, important aspect of tonight is the way in which this university is so well represented across uh, our schools and disciplines. Neil Ferguson is the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History at Harvard University and the William Ziegler Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Professor Ferguson is a critically acclaimed, uh, best-selling author in the UK and the US, most recent books, Empire, Colossus, The War of the World, and The Ascent of money have formed the basis themselves for television documentaries. He's a contributing editor for the Financial Times and a regular contributor uh, to Newsweek. Uh, Lonnie Guineer is the Bennett Bosky Professor at Harvard Law School. Professor Guineer is a former civil rights lawyer who specializes in voting rights law, democratic theory, practice, educational access, and social justice with an emphasis on issues of race, gender, and class. She's authored and co-authored numerous articles and five books. Prior to her teaching career, Professor Guineer worked in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice and directed the Voting Rights Project at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And finally, rounding out our panel this evening is IOP resident fellow Peggy Noonan. Peggy Noonan is a columnist for the Wall Street Journal and the best-selling author of seven books on American politics, history, and culture. We are especially lucky and pleased to, to uh, recognize tonight that we have Peggy Noonan here uh, in residence at the Institute of Politics for this fall semester where she'll be leading a study group and for students who are interested tomorrow night, we'll have an open house in this space where you can learn more about her study group and the other study groups that will be offered during the course of this year. In 1996, she was one of 10 historians and writers who contributed essays on the American presidency for the book Character Above All. In 1995, she hosted her own PBS series on the debate over American values. Noonan has a background in public service uh, as a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan from 1984 to 1986, and in 1988 as chief speechwriter for George Bush during the time that he was running for the presidency. Please join me in wel welcoming Professor Sandel and this outstanding panel.
Well, thank you, Bill, very much. And I want to thank all of you for coming and give a special word of thanks to this really all-star panel of colleagues and friends. It's really a great privilege to have them be here to join in this discussion. Neil Ferguson, the prolific and prodigious and provocative historian who's taught us about everything from the history of money to how America should take up and live up to its imperial responsibilities. Uh, Lonnie Guineer, one of our generation's leader in the theory and the practice of civil rights and social justice, and Peggy Noonan, who brought poetry and grace to the speeches of Ronald Reagan, and now a writer and commentator in her own right. It's really a great privilege to, uh, to, be, to have the three of us, uh, the, the three of these colleagues here for this discussion. The book lays out three basic approaches to the question, what is justice? So our time is short, and rather than give you the history of political thought about the idea of justice, I will tell you in a single word for each of the three traditions what they say. And then, before I finish, I'll try to suggest something about who's right. And then we'll have a discussion. There are three basic answers to the question, what is justice? Each can be summed up in a word or a slogan. Utility, seeking the greatest happiness for the greatest number. That's number one. Two, consent, respecting the rights and the freedom of individuals. And three, virtue, promoting virtue in, through government and law and trying to realize the good life. Those, broadly speaking, are three answers that the history of political philosophy offers to the question, what is justice? How should we think about justice? The first two, maximizing utility or happiness, and respecting people's rights to choose for themselves, the first two are the most familiar theories of justice in contemporary <laughs> debate, certainly within the Anglo-American world. Apart from showing how these different approaches to justice show up in contemporary public life, the book does have an argument, and the argument is that the third answer, the third approach, the one that argues about virtue and the common good, is dangerous because tying justice and law to virtue brings to mind fundamentalists and forms of intolerance and imposing virtue on those who may disagree. It's dangerous, but it's also indispensable and an unavoidable feature of any politics that aspires to the good society. That's the argument of the book. Let me illustrate with a few contemporary issues and then see what my friends and colleagues have to say. The idea that justice is about maximizing happiness, the greatest good for the greatest number, came out recently when we had the debate about Wall Street bailouts and bonuses. Many Americans thought that that was pretty hard to take, the idea of bailing out and subsidizing wealthy banks and Wall Street investment houses who had messed up the economy and brought the financial system to near ruin. But, it was argued, we had to hold our nose and do it. Why? For the sake of the greatest good for the greatest number. We had to do something that didn't seem quite fair, providing tax money for these very wealthy people and institutions, because it was, argue, it was argued otherwise the whole financial system would come tumbling down on everyone, including not only Wall Street, but Main Street. The greatest good for the greatest number. 
So the argument from utility, maximizing the overall level of welfare or happiness, seemed to outweigh worries about, well, these, these guys don't really deserve it. So that's the force, the weight of the argument of utility. Now, sometimes our debates are within one of these three ideas. Sometimes they take place between or among those approaches. If you really thought justice was just a matter of seeking the greatest good for the greatest number, the maximizing happiness, then you might say if there were a small religion that were despised by the majority. The right thing to do would be to let the majority persecute and suppress that religion, provided it made the majority happier than it made those few minority adherents unhappy. That's one of the counts against the utilitarian way of thinking. That brings out the force of the second idea, consent respecting the right of people, individuals, to choose freely for themselves. How to worship, for example. So the second approach says freedom, respect for individuals, trumps, sometimes at least, calculations about what will make more people happy. And so we respect religious freedom, even if some people would rather persecute a despised minority. Now, if you believe there are certain fundamental human rights or individual rights that should trump utility or the greatest happiness, where does that lead you? It leads people in two different directions. Some say that leads to a free market economy. Whatever consenting adults freely agree to trade and exchange in a free market economy, the outcome is just. And it tax away money that people earn fairly through free exchange is unjust. Take the debate over health care. Where does the, the freedom party or the consent party come out? Well, there may be a division. It may be that our debate over health care is actually a debate within the consent or the freedom or the individual rights approach. Because on the one hand, what really is the health care debate about? About the public option and the responsibility of government for health care for everyone. There are some people who say, really, that's not government's business. If you respect individual freedom, you let people choose for themselves whether to buy health insurance. That's respecting freedom. You don't use the force of the state to tax away their hard-earned money to pay for health care for those who choose not to have any. That's one freedom argument. And then others say, no, there is a responsibility. If you really believe in respecting the freedom of each citizen to choose for himself or herself, the best way to live, you can't let people be subject to bankruptcy or to financial ruin if they get sick. It's not their fault. So really to respect individual rights and freedom is actually to take a public responsibility for everybody's health care, even if that means taxing the, the wealthy to provide it. So that's a debate that we have within the freedom approach to justice. Now, let me take one final example. You might say, and the example is the debate over same-sex marriage. You might say, well, here's a debate between consent and the freedom to choose on the one hand, and the third idea, virtue on the other. The virtue idea has a kind of conservative flavor very often these days in our politics. People who want government or law to promote virtue, they tend to be conservatives, we often think. And so there are some who say, no, there shouldn't be same-sex marriage because marriage is fundamentally a way of honoring and encouraging and promoting procreation and traditional family structures. That's what marriage is for. 
That's a virtue-like argument. And then on the other side, there are those who say, no, there should be a right to same-sex marriage in the name of respecting what consenting adults may choose to do. So it seems straightforwardly like a debate between the consent approach on the one hand and the virtue approach, in this case, a conservative traditionalist approach on the other. But I don't think that's what it's really about. I think, actually, the reason there is such passion in the argument over same-sex marriage is that even though we don't fully articulate it, always, it's really an argument about competing conceptions of virtue and the common good. What's really at stake in the same-sex marriage debate is a matter of moral judgment. What sort of unions, what sort of family units are worthy of honor and recognition by the political community as a whole? If you only cared about respecting what consenting adults might choose to do, you wouldn't have the state involved in recognizing any marriage. You would disestablish marriage as a state function altogether. States would not pass judgment on who is and who isn't worthy of a marriage license from the state. You would leave that to private associations. But we don't. Almost no one on Either side of the same-sex marriage debate says the state should have no role at all. The issue is what kinds of unions and family relations are worthy of honor and recognition? And what really is marriage for? Is it about procreation only? Or is it about also an exclusive, lifelong, loving commitment? Those are rival conceptions about the virtue, the moral purpose that state recognition of marriage is about. So here's an illustration of the main argument of the book. Although on the face of it, most of our arguments about justice seem to be about how to maximize utility or GDP on the one hand, and how to respect people's freedom to choose consent on the other, our most heated public debates are really debates about what virtues, what human goods, what visions of the good life should government and law and public policy embody and encourage and express? Why, thinking back to the bailout case, why was there such public anger at those bailouts and those bonuses, even though it seemed that for economic reasons, we had to do it because deep down, people believed that these executives displayed not virtue, but greed. And therefore, they didn't deserve this bailout. And the reason we had to hold our nose was because we believed there was something, however necessary economically, there was something unjust because at odds with what people deserve, something unjust about bailing them out. Utility, consent, and virtue. My suggestion is that the last, though it seems in a way quaint and ancient, is actually at the heart of our debates today about justice. Want to lead off? Yeah. Well, Michael, I, I volunteered to go first in case you're thinking I'm pushy and assertive. Um, I'd like to begin by complimenting you on this wonderful book. Unlike 100,000 Harvard graduates, I didn't have the privilege of taking your course, Justice. Um, but actually, this is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful book, not least because it's the first book I've ever read that makes me understand what Kant was saying. And trying to understand Kant is the hardest thing you can do as an academic. Uh, and and this, this book solved that problem for me after 45 years uh, of bewilderment. But I, I don't think you have any trouble persuading me in the book that I'm not a utilitarian. I've stared at the embalmed, stuffed uh, corpse of Jeremy Bentham, and it did nothing for me. Uh, 
I'm not sure you're ever going to get me to be enthusiastic about virtue. I just see Robespierre every time you use that yeah. word. Uh, the embodiment of Republican virtue, sending people uh, to the guillotine. I want to take you back to your middle uh, position, the second conception of justice, the one about rights or freedom, liberty. Because right at the heart of the book, it seems to me, you deal with a debate, a very central debate uh, in the United States between, let us say, a Hayekian or Freedomite conception yeah. of rights and liberty and the Rawlsian conception, uh, which would uh, privilege equality more than the Hayekians or Freedomites would. And I'd like you to talk a bit about that. Maybe say something about uh, Tocqueville. Now, Tocqueville doesn't rate a mention in the book, but Tocqueville always saw that as being, at least in some cases, like the case of France, a fundamental tension between the goal of individual rights and the goal of equality. And his great warning in L'Ancien Régime, also in Democracy in America, is if you, at least in some contexts, care too much about equality, then you will end up with tyranny and you'll lose liberty. I felt you didn't really grapple with that, and yet it seems to me absolutely central to any discussion of justice. So give, give me some thoughts on, on where Tocqueville fits in. And also, secondly, the law of unintended consequences. Every time I read Rawls, and I never quite get as far as I want to, I ask myself, what would happen if this were really implemented? What would the unintended consequences be? And would a Rawlsian world look like the European Union? Would it be a world in which uh, there were no great disputes about bonuses because there weren't great inequalities of uh, of income? Would it be a world in which religious minorities were tolerated no matter how intolerant they were, even if they were hell-bent on the destruction uh, of our society, as some religious minorities today are? And presumably, this would also be a society in which same-sex marriage was tolerated and no marriage at all was tolerated. That's really the European model. I wonder if, if the Rawlsian model, which I think you favor over the Hayekian model, ends up looking like the European Union. And, and that would be bad. <laughs> no, it no. just would be interesting to know if that's what you think. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me come to that. Maybe we should... I won't forget, but shall I we... I let you. Sure. Yes. I'll jump in. Peggy, do you want... Um, uh, I'll tell you how much I like Michael's book, which he was kind enough to give me uh, uh, this past Friday. He opens up with a story about price gouging during Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Andrew, I forget which. Earlier one. Yeah, Andrew, between maybe. Price gouging during a hurricane. People have a local motel, they double the price of a room when a hurricane is coming, which is taking advantage of a calamity and being ungenerous, but what should the state do about it? This may sound dry, but it was fascinating to me, considering what is the appropriate response to something inherently unjust, like knowing a hurricane is coming, having a motel, and doubling uh, the cost of a room, knowing that people will be coming in and, and, and seeking uh, safety where you are. Michael made this very interesting. I have not mentioned to him that I did think about politically what the response would be to price gouging, price gouging, sorry price gouging in Florida during a, a hurricane. The response after the hurricane would be that people would complain to the governor of Florida. And the governor of Florida would immediately look at them, hear them, and take a poll. After he took the poll, he would find out that price gouging was extremely unpopular. He would then put forward a bill saying, price gouging should be illegal. The legislature would support it. There would be headlines the next day saying, no more price gouging, says governor. And, and that would be how the whole thing would be resolved, except because we are mischievous, marvelous, complicated human beings, it isn't really where the story would end. There would be loads of side dramas the next time another hurricane came in. Anyway, Michael made this all more interesting in the book than, than, uh, 
than what I am saying. And made the, the abstract issues of justice uh, very interesting. Um, I just have some, some quick comments that bounce off a little bit of what you've heard. Whenever I hear the word justice, I always want it to be coupled with the word mercy. Mercy and justice, they just hopefully go together. I think in any society trying to do its job and, and keep it together, justice and mercy must together uh, move forward. Um, I also think, you know, as we make our political decisions about how to get justice in America, there are certain things we can sort of keep in mind, and I don't know if they go under the heading the utilitarian school um, or, or, or ideas impacted by Tocquevillian insights. To me, they're, they're very simple. One is you got to know who man is. He's complicated. And it's very hard when you're making laws to make these overarching things that fit everybody, but also not even fit everybody, that take into account the complicated little being with a soul that we are. So that's sort of where I start. Um, I also want our political figures also, as they go forward towards justice, which is one of the purposes of politics, I always want them to have a practical sense of what works, knowing man, but also knowing what works in the world. Neil said a wonderful phrase when we were in the, the green room. He quoted a mentor of his once who said, I take the world as it is. As I find it. I take the world as I find it. I like seeing things grounded in reality and practicality. That may not be necessarily uh, a, a guide that unquestioningly gets you where you want to be, but it's a good thing to have in your head as you uh, begin. Um, I always think sometimes everything in moderation. I'm old enough now to have heard so many good political ideas. Let's do this and let's do that and no, we're going to go this way, no, we're going to go that way. I must say, as a person observing politics now and for the past 10 years, moderation and a sense of where the center is in America and a sense of centrality does look better and better to me all the time. Um, uh, let me touch on just one uh, uh, of, of the political examples you gave, and that was bailouts. Uh, the bailouts of, of, say, the past year, I think almost exactly a year. Uh, from the Bush White House and then the Obama uh, White House. One of the problems with the political figures is that they're not philosopher kings. But in a way, it's also one of the good things about political figures. But they, they I think they sometimes struggle with abstract ideas. Uh, they sort of, I think, political figures in general don't go from the abstract to the particular but if we're very lucky and they're really smart from the particular to the abstract, they have to make decisions in real time. The problem with the bailouts, to me, in part, the bailouts are still a mystery. Here's the problem with them. It was last September, I think it was just exactly 12 months ago, uh, the president was not Mr. Obama, but Mr. Bush. Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson came to the White House and said, essentially, we, I mean, essentially, to paraphrase, we have to bail out Wall Street. We've got to do a huge bailout now, because if we don't, the entire American economic system is going to collapse. Now, practical political figures are going to hear that, and they're going to think, really? Holy mackerel. If that's true, then we better move. And there's no way to know at that moment whether or not it's true. But when everybody, when smart people like Bernanke and Paulson start telling you this is true, we really got to do something, and then the political figures, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, various Republicans and Democrats, when they start to come on board and to say, all right, we better take a chance on this and do what we're being told is the right thing. They're living so much in a world of, of practical 
of a practical calculation that goes like this. If we do a bailout, it may or may not turn out right, but we'll have a little margin of, of error. If we don't do a bailout and it turns out that the warnings were correct and the entire financial system is going to go be upended, well, that's quite another thing. And I think they felt that it is as dramatic as the bailouts look to us, and they look dramatic to me, it seemed at the time like a prudent course. And their decisions were based merely, or, or almost essentially, on practical calculations mm -hmm. that may or may not have turned out right. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's all I'm saying. It's mm -hmm. not abstract for them. It's sort of nitty gritty, and they may or may not be right. Lonnie, what do you think? Well, I'm trying to, I, 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 I respect very much what um, Peggy is saying in terms of the importance of making things practical and concrete. And her story, starting with the price gouging during the hurricane, is successfully concrete. And I think my reservation, Michael, about your three approaches to justice is that the idea of virtue is really not concrete. And I would like to hear a little bit more about what you mean by virtue, because I, I think it could mean many things. Just the word itself bothers me because it sounds both elegant and very aristocratic. So if you're talking about the common good and you're talking about virtue, it seems like there's a fundamental inconsistency. On the other hand, the word virtue and the way in which, as I understand it, you're applying it is really a reference to politics. It's a reference to the importance of rigorous debate around the values that we can coalesce um, to support or to, um, to, to consider. And I don't think for most people, virtue summons up this idea of, of politics or of debate yeah. or of yeah. deliberation, which is what I think, yeah. I think you mean. Right. And so my question to you is why, why virtue rather than deliberation or democracy as right. the third right. uh, plank in, in, the, uh, yeah. in the approaches to justice. The second, so the first is to be more concrete about virtue. The second is to rethink the term virtue. And then the third is to, because I like your idea of using virtue to mediate the other two commitments, that is the greatest yeah. good for the greatest number, and the respect for individual rights, and that neither of those two poles can stand alone, and they need to be mediated, and as I understand what you're saying, is they need to be mediated through a process that encourages people to deliberate and debate about their fundamental values, and those values may change, and those values should also be responsive to the concrete needs of a situation, which brings me to the third point, which is history. It seems that the idea of justice cannot be deliberated or um, debated in the abstract, not just because people need the concrete reference point that um, Peggy is advocating, but because people are not here as um, independent individuals without a history. And it's a history that's a collective history as well as their own individual history. And in my view, any kind of commitment to justice has to take into account the historical forces in which people are um, living. So just to make it concrete and to um, uh, also suggest that it's a subject of legitimate debate, I would give you the example of reparations for slavery. And according to some uh, work that I've read by um, various professors, one at uh, MIT, 97% of Americans are opposed to the idea of reparations for slavery, and 72% um, are opposed to the idea of an apology for slavery. I don't stand behind those figures, I'm just repeating them. 
it's obviously something that is quite contentious. And yet, in terms of virtue, and in, so not the greatest good for the greatest number, and not simply based on the rights and freedom of individuals, but in terms of virtue, I think it would be healthy to have a rigorous debate about reparations for slavery and to talk about the historical effect of slavery on the individual rights and freedom of certain people who are the descendants of slaves. So one of the people who's actually pursuing this tack is Sandy Darity, a professor of economics and African American studies at Duke. And he talks about the importance of intergenerational wealth transfer as a source of, um, of, of people's opportunity in the current um, situation. And you, you allude to reparations and, and to issues of compensation for slavery in your discussion of affirmative action. But his point is to get people to think more concretely about the consequences of holding people in bondage for more than 250 years as property, who then also are denied the opportunity to gain property even after they've been liberated. And to speak of another now world-renowned Harvard professor, Henry Louis Gates, did a documentary about um, the DNA of a number of prominent African Americans. And I believe there were 18 or 19 of these individuals who were interviewed. And of those, let's say, 19, 17 of them came from families that actually owned property in 1920. And part of the, the point of this story is to say that the people who own property today are the descendants, in general, of people who own property in 1920. Uh, uh, to support that point, Sandy Darity talks about the median household net worth for uh, white Americans is $90,000. The median household net worth for Latinos is $8,000. And the median household net worth for blacks is $6,000. And almost 30% of African Americans have a zero or negative net worth. So that when we're talking about justice, it's hard to think about the greatest good for the greatest number if we're talking just about African Americans who are obviously not the majority. But it's also hard to think about the rights and freedom of individuals because you can say that blacks are, now have similar freedom as uh, whites or Latinos, and yet they're suffering with this historical legacy that is denying them the opportunity to exercise those rights and responsibilities in the same way as others. Great. Well, let me pick up, if I could, on a few of the strands that I, and I think there are some connected strands among the observations. We'll have a, maybe a bit of a discussion and then uh, open the floor for a broader uh, discussion. Uh, two of the strands, have, one has to do with moderation, the other with virtue. Um, Peggy, as, as a, uh, you spoke powerfully for the virtues of moderation. And that's a sensible position up to a point. I would say moderation up to a point. There was a famous, some say infamous, passage in the acceptance speech of Barry Goldwater in the 1964 Republican National Convention. When he responded to those who said he was an extremist, now he was very, he was a libertarian. He and, and Neil distinguished hugely important distinction between the libertarian strand of the freedom idea and the more egalitarian version that informs the American welfare state. And Barry Goldwater was very much a libertarian opponent of the, of the welfare state. And he said in his speech, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice, moderation in pursuit of justice, Peggy, is no virtue. I you think know. Barry Goldwater was that wrong? That was 1964. I yes. was a teenager, and I remember it. Yeah. Do I think he was wrong? Yes, frankly. I think that was, well, let me tell you in a, just a narrowly political way, yeah. wow, 
That was one of the hot, bad lines. <laughs> but it was it's a wonderful line. We politics. remember it. How many lines do we remember now this many years later? Oh, you remember lots of things yeah. that didn't work and aren't very good. But here's, here's what I want to know. When you, listen, when you heard it, <laughs> when you heard it as a teenager, yeah. um, whether or not you thought it would be politically effective, well, did you swell with affirmation and agreement? No. You didn't, even then. Oh my goodness, I was yeah. a teenager. I, yeah. I really didn't know who Barry Goldwater was in any sort of sophisticated <laughs> way. And I think I correctly remember thinking, boy, he's angry. Hmm. You know? Yeah. When you're running for office in America, you don't want them looking at you and saying, boy, he's angry. Yeah. So, so this already didn't resonate, that wasn't. You didn't find but, this a powerful clarion call to. Oh, I wasn't old enough to okay. find it All to right. be a clarion call, <laughs> right. but let me. But let me tell you that yeah. I believe the gentleman who worked on that speech with Barry Goldwater is Henry Jaffa. Yeah. Does, does that ring a bell yeah. for you? Yeah, he's All a right. Strassian well, political philosopher. Yes, yeah. he is. Uh, and Henry Jaffa is still here. He is still among us. And he gave an interview just about 10 days ago with National Review magazine. And they asked him about that line from the Goldwater speech in 1964. And he said, he felt it helped Barry Goldwater lose the 1964 hmm. yeah. election. Sometimes Speech writers things, can be dangerous. Oh, they certainly can. Yeah. And you know what? Believe me, I would know. <laughs> Sometimes the most, the most interesting and definite and piercing thing can become an arrow that turns around in the air and yeah. comes straight back at you. Right. So anyway, that's not a big philosophical no, thing but to it, say. No, but I was interested no, to know what you thought. No, Actually, no. I wanted to say that the last part of that, anyhow, moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. I think there's something to that, even though I'm no Barry Goldwater fan. I wanted, but I wanted then to turn to virtue. And Neil said that talk of virtue reminds him first of Robespierre. Yeah. Fair enough. And Lonnie said the word bothers her and it smacks of aristocracy. And it seems. You don't know many aristocrats, is all <laughs> I can say. <laughs> they're not virtuous as a rule. Yeah, but they're snobbish. <laughs> they're snobbish. And that's what virtue makes you think of snobbery. Well, here I want to ask, um, I want to see if I can. And I might not be able to, but I want to see if I can vindicate the use of virtue to capture this third tradition. It's meant, and I should say, this is the first public discussion of the book. So maybe you'll tell me uh, it's a huge mistake if I talk about virtue as the name for the third tradition, the counterpoint to utility and rights. But I sort of want it to be disquieting. And then I want to see if I can save it. Maybe that's a hopeless task. It does remind people of Robespierre or of quaint, aristocratic snootiness. Or of the Book of Virtues, you know? Of, of that's what you think of when you hear virtue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, Robespierre did it for me. <laughs> All right. But, uh, so, but I understand it's funny. It's a very sweet word that has some dramatic connotations now. Including a connection even with terror. And intolerance in, in, absolutely. in politics, when virtue enters politics. So here's why I want to try to save it. But it, maybe you'll tell me it's a hopeless task and I'm barking up the wrong tree. I do want, Lonnie, I do want to connect the virtue tradition with the common good and with the tradition of civic virtue, mm -hmm. which has a different resonance and association. The reason I'm tempted to use virtue to describe this counterpoint to utility and individual rights, apart from its shock value, is that it identifies a defect or a weakness of those first two traditions which they share, namely that they both are, try to be non-judgmental. Economists don't pass judgment on the consumer preferences they cater to, they try to figure out how can we satisfy as many of them as possible. Can I interrupt and ask a question? What's the difference in your mind between the utilitarian idea of the yes. greatest good for the greatest number yes. and your 
notion, an Aristotelian yes. notion, I'm assuming, yes, of the common is. good. Because the common right. good also makes me think of the French Revolution, makes me think of Rousseau, and again, right. I, I see the guillotine. But that's just right. my British upbringing. No, well, but maybe, what, what's maybe the, a little. What's the, what's maybe the difference? A little. What's the, the, difference? difference? the difference is that uh, between the utility and the majoritarianism that goes with it. And the, and the common good. And the common good is the, the, the tradition of the common good that I want to try to revive and make a more prominent feature of American public discourse is avowedly judgmental. It says it's a mistake to try to banish from our politics substantive moral and even spiritual questions. Now, Lani talked about deliberation. Uh, I would rather embrace the idea of democratic contest and argument. I don't think we can come or should try to come to agreement in our politics about virtue or, or even the common good. But the tradition of the common good I'm trying to resuscitate is connected with virtue because unlike these other traditions, it's avowedly judgmental. It says politics and law can't be neutral with respect to the moral and even religious convictions that citizens care about. And the attempt to try to be neutral or non-judgmental leads to a kind of emptiness in our politics. I wanted just to pick up on the example, because people want, rightly, concreteness of reparations, the reparations debate that Lonnie mentioned. And there's a section in the book where I take up the, the reparations question. There is a tendency to rule that, Lonnie, one of the reasons that it's often regarded as a non-starter for many people in those polls you cite is that from the standpoint of the individual rights tradition, it's hard to make sense of collective responsibility of a community across time and across generations. And what I find powerful in the, in the best argument for reparations is it takes head on those individualistic assumptions in our politics. And it says maybe we have some collective responsibilities that are bound up with our history, with our shared history. When it came up in Congress, Henry Hyde, the Republican congressman, conservative, said, reparations, I never owned any slaves. Why should I be responsible for the legacy of slavery? That was a deeply individualist argument that comes very quickly across the political spectrum to the American mind. And that's the, the individualism that I want to lean against, and that I think is an inadequate basis for arguing about health care and the welfare state, and reparations, and same-sex marriage. So that's why I want to try to revive an understanding of the common good that is avowedly judgmental, even though I agree. It raises worries about the risks and the danger, if not the guillotine, of the moral majority and the, and the fundamentalists who will impose. That's the fear. And I want to say, don't seed to the most intolerant voices a monopoly on the richest moral and spiritual resources of the tradition. And I think this has been a failure of liberals and progressives in the United States to try to be neutral. So maybe that's not a convincing answer, but that's what I'm up to. That's, that's why I want to try to, to hang on to this, to connect virtue and the common good rather than to prize them apart. I don't know, is that, would that, would that, is that a hopeless you, thing? Does that lead you to support the idea of reparations for the descendants of slaves? Well, I'm sympathetic to it. As, uh, I, I, would not, I don't think it should be ruled out on the Henry Hyde grounds that an individual today can't be responsible for what his community or his country did. In fact, if you accept that idea, odd that conservatives should embrace that idea, because conservatives should also, uh, do, also embrace the idea of patriotism, loyalty to one's country, pride in the past of one's country. I think pride in the past of one's country and community, in the founders. We weren't around when the founders did what they did. How can we be proud of what they did without some sense of collective responsibility and a historic burden? 
if you can have pride in the past of one's people and community and history, I think one can also uh, not avoid the taking of responsibility for the sins of the past and one's predecessors. So I'm sympathetic in that way. Now, as a practical matter, what would be the best way of giving expression to this burden? I think that's a further question, open to debate. Should it be individual payment? Should it be support for certain institutions? That, that's another matter. But as a matter of justice, it seems to me uh, a suggestive and important possibility. Is that? You're still thinking of Robespierre, I can see. Or is that no, all right? I'm thinking of the unintended consequences of right. a jolly good idea, which sounds jolly good when you express it in terms right. of uh, natural justice, but when you try to implement it, it creates huge social fissures. Sure. I mean, think of Skip Gates's research. What else did he find? He found that many of the people whose DNA he studied were 25% Irish, including himself. Does that, do you get a 25% discount on your compensation if you actually have Irish genes? The, the practicalities of this thing make a nonsense of the idea and doesn't, it well, doesn't no, get past no, no. first base. Actually, space. Sandy Darity has an interesting solution. He proposes baby bonds or uh, expanding Hillary Clinton's idea of baby bonds so that anyone in the United States, white, black, descendant of slavery or not, who is at 30% um, of the median white household net worth would be entitled to $18,000 when they become 18. So it's basically targeting the phenomenon of intergenerational wealth transfer and not trying to um, pin, pigeonhole it onto a particular identity. But then it just becomes a redistribution compensating for poverty through right, the tax system, which you dress up in some kind of pseudo-historical Right, regard. but that's one of the I legacies of, of slavery. More, but I can't think of anything more divisive than to say, we're going to in increase equality in the United States, but we're disproportionately going to try and compensate for slavery. That seems, no, no, that no, seems no, no, to no, confuse no, no. two different this, objectives. No, we're going to redistribute wealth because it has been distributed in a way that is very unequal. Well, you can certainly debate about the inequality, but you can't then claim that the inequality is entirely a consequence of slavery. I mean, what about the victims of the class system? What about the propertyless immigrant workers who, yes, notionally well, were free, would... but had no property? How do you make that distinction? It seems pointless. But that's my point. You're not making that distinction. You're saying anyone. Then what's it got to do with slavery? If it's because just about you will cover you will cover 90% of black people if you do that. Well, from a practical political point of view, I can't think of anything more disastrous. Can you, Peggy? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, shall we see? We have, we have microphones. We want to bring, now, as, as this discussion has become increasingly sedate, we thought, not really, uh, we want to uh, hear from you. So there are microphones upstairs and over here. So if you have a, a question you'd like to contribute in the the rules of the house, we're told, are that you should say, uh, you should identify yourself first, please. Who would like to begin? Go ahead. Oh, hello, my name is Min. I'm an alumnus of Harvard College and a graduate student. I wanted to ask about your threefold typology of different theories of justice. You mentioned theories of um, utilitarianism, theories of rights, as well as um, theories of virtue. I wanted to ask where uh, John Stuart Mill falls in that threefold typology, because on the one hand, he is a utilitarian, right. but he also believes that that utilitarianism grounds a very robust respect for individual rights, and yet he also believes that the exercise of individual rights will actually promote um, the good and more virtuous uh, characters, because people will, by exercising their individual judgment, become more spontaneous, become uh, more morally well-informed, wiser. So unlike uh, Rawls and Hayek, he believes that uh, the liberal exercise of individual rights will promote virtue. So he seems to cross all three of your distinctions. He, he does. You're absolutely right. John Stuart Mill tries to have it all three ways. He's the most influential utilitarian, I suppose you could say. But that's partly because he was an inconsistent philosopher. And he knew the, the pure... Uh, most consistent utilitarian philosopher was the one whose it uh, was Jeremy Bentham, and he um, he invented utilitarianism as a doctrine, and he's the one whose stuffed body Neil has um, observed, not worshipped, but observed, and the reason that Bentham's stuffed body is available for 
viewing at University College London is that he believed, uh, he, he wanted to kind of banish the whole idea of metaphysical ghosts and the soul. He didn't believe in any of that. It was just a matter of maximizing the balance of pleasure over pain. That was pure utilitarianism. And so he said, when I die, how can I carry on contributing to the greatest good for the greatest number? And he said, I might give my corpse for the study of anatomy. That would contribute. And maybe most people should do that. But in the case of great philosophers, <laughs> there's something even better we could do. Uh, to, and so he provided in his will that his body be preserved and uh, as an example to inspire future generations of philosophers. And so preserved, it's well preserved in the way they preserve bodies and it was stuffed and he's dressed in his clothing and he's in a box, with a glass box at University College London, isn't that? Where he is? It's, and it's, it's, yes, it's slightly more like Madame Tussauds than, uh, than Lerland's <laughs> tomb, to be honest. And the head didn't get embalmed properly, so they had to put on a fake one. Uh, Wait, which I'm the head? Yes, his head. That didn't work out, so <laughs> the head isn't real, which is so, sla sad when you consider that a philosopher's really about the head, right? <laughs> Maybe that's the point. <laughs> and for a time, you've gotten us onto a ghoulish uh, strand of philosophy. For a time, the actual head for verisimilitude was displayed on a plate at his feet. But then the students stole it and used it for, well, for various illicit purposes. And they ransomed it back to the college, and they now keep it locked in the cellar, the head. Anyhow, so Jeremy Bentham was uh, a true, thoroughgoing, consistent utilitarian. And John Stuart Mill saw the flaws in that idea of maximizing pleasure, and so wrote eloquently in the defense of respect for individual rights, but he said on utilitarian grounds, in the long run, that will maximize happiness if we respect rights. And Can I ask a question? Yeah. Why do philosophers do philosophy? What are they trying to do? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Oh, I don't mean that as a challenge. I mean, like, if you want to make, good. yeah, if you want to go into making shoes, you make shoes, and yes. there's a purpose to it. Sometimes with philosophy, I don't understand why they're doing it. Right. <laughs> well, to <laughs> the short answer, Peggy, is to get at the truth. And the slightly longer answer is, in the case of political philosophy, to try to get as close as we can to understanding what justice and liberty and equality and citizenship and democracy really mean and require of us now. That's at least as good as making shoes, isn't it? You have to hope. <laughs> yeah. right. the, so the short answer is Mill tried to fix the defects in consistent Benthamite utilitarianism and in doing it, some people say he succeeded. I would say he succeeded only by essentially checking out the core assumptions of utilitarianism and embracing strands of the other two theories, as you very rightly say. Hi, my name is Daniel Lage. I'm a junior at the college. I want to turn the discussion a little bit towards healthcare, healthcare. especially because of the timeliness. Yeah. Um, I think that nowhere, I mean, when you talk about the idea of health as a right, people generally agree, but like you said, in practice, it's very difficult um, to look at justice because at where, which point do you draw the line? And so sort of if perhaps the panel could talk about how do you decide what is just when the government takes the responsibility for care or the private market, whatever it may be, and how do comparative approaches to this succeed or fail? Right, and, and that brings together, Daniel's question brings together, and I want to put it to the panel. We've been here talking about the practical aspects of politics, what policy will work to achieve a given goal, and the principled aspects of politics, what goals are worth aiming at, what goals are in line with justice. So w would it be a fair formulation, Daniel, of your question if I put to my colleagues this version to what extent, obviously there are a lot of practical questions involved with healthcare, what will work and so on. 
it's a matter of efficiency and so on. But in what respect, if any, is the healthcare debate a debate about justice? Yeah. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Does anyone? Lonnie. I do think that the healthcare debate is, um, well, it, it's, it's unfortunately not a debate, right? You mean what we've been having? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't participated, and I don't think most people have enough information on which to, uh, to participate and form a judgment. But the media is, is, is trying to convene a conversation, uh, more like a circus, about um, utilitarianism, consent, and I guess in some ways virtue. They don't talk about that in the media, really. What, virtue? Do they? Well, in, in the sense of um, what would be the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. it's not, the fact that it's the greatest good for the greatest yeah. number does not answer the question because you then have people right. whose rights will be trampled on because right. they will lose their own health care right. um, choices right. to a, a government-imposed option. Right. But yes, I do think that the debate about health care is, could be, could be, could a, be. A, a debate about um, justice. But I think in the debate about health care, it would probably be worthwhile to get concrete again. And I think what the um, Obama administration should do, this is my view of justice, is to show what it has in mind by having free healthcare clinics around the country and see who comes and whether they like being treated by the people who are available to fix their teeth or um, uh, ch um, check out the state of their tonsils. And then have a debate about whether this kind of opportunity for everyone to have something that is considered right. really valuable right. available, is that something that we should, we, we should be considering? Right. right now it's too abstract. One thing that struck me in listening to the uh, tributes to Senator Kennedy, um, and they played excerpts of his various speeches, when he spoke about health care, he spoke about it in moral terms, and he said that he was fighting for the day when in the United States health care would be regarded as a right and not a privilege, not based on your ability to pay. He cast the issue always in terms of morality and justice, and that struck me as a contrast to the way the issue's been framed in this debate. I think one of the reasons, and maybe he will recover in his speech the, the moral dimension of it, tomorrow night, President Obama, I think one of the reasons that he's lost the upper hand, the initiative, in the healthcare debate recently, is that he's been talking too much about the economic aspects, the technical aspects. I heard him in a town meeting watching on C-SPAN talking about how we have to get the cost, bend the cost curve and so on, <laughs> and rather than the bigger moral questions about um, the responsibility that citizens have for one another in a decent society to provide health care for everyone. And then the details can be secondary. What do you, what are, do you think? But there are counter moral arguments, aren't there? There are. When, when we have a government whose deficit spending is so big and so prolonged and will go so far into the future, that we're literally borrowing our way each day out of the problem, which means we're putting the cost of what we have right now on our kids. That's a moral question. Is it right hmm. to, to have a government that is giving us certain things we want, but putting the price on our children and our grandchildren and making them, they didn't get the right to say that's a good idea or that's not. They're just born with a burden on their back, which is a tax burden. Um, it, there, uh, let me also mention that there are, oh heck, there are many people in America who are so wealthy that tax burdens don't really hurt them. They're so wealthy that they couldn't buy a better steak anyway. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If their taxes mm -hmm. go up 3%, it means very little. But you know what, if you're not, if you are married 
and have two or three kids and you live in a nice but not a you know not huge house in New Jersey it costs three hundred fifty thousand dollars if you're making a hundred fifty a year and your taxes are going to go up and your property taxes are going to go up and everything your taxes are going to go up to pay for all of this more government and more programs that you want. Those taxes are going to hurt you. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just going to take a bite out of you because you're not wealthy. You're just an average person. I don't think it's moral to not worry about the tax burden mm -hmm. we're putting on our children. I don't think it's moral to not worry about the tax burden we're putting on people who have well, a Peggy, real struggle to pay for taxes. I don't think people who live in a $350,000 taxes. house are an average person. Say they're not, but there's plenty of these Americans. Do you no, know I just, making I'm just, 100 or 150? Right, just, just, the reason I don't say people making 30 or $40,000 a year is that many of them are not paying taxes. But you're getting clobbered if you're making 100, 150, No, my only disagreement is that those, those are people doing $350,000 in New Jersey. A $350,000 house that, that you have $100,000 in. Do you know what I mean? And you got a $250,000 mortgage. It sounds rich. It ain't rich. But and they're carrying burdens. We're having a utilitarian discussion, which always seems to happen on, on health care. And I'm realizing that I, I'm with John Stuart Mill. We have to address this question from all three of your different vantage points to understand it properly. From a utilitarian point of view, it's absolutely clear that healthcare does not provide in the United States anything like the greatest good for the greatest number. It stands out internationally as almost the worst system you could possibly devise from that point of view. It has an anomaly, which is a glaring anomaly, even from a conservative vantage point, that healthcare is linked to employment. Why should that be? I do not know. Uh, it's anomalous. It stands out in any international comparison. It clearly can't be defended in any rational basis. But there's also an issue about rights. What's interesting is the way in which Republican critics of the administration have tried to make this not a utilitarian discussion at all, but a discussion about mm. rights and the notional liberty uh, that one has to choose, and the suspected erosion of that liberty that would be created right. by public provision. I right. think that's spurious, actually. It's clear if you look at the German system or the French system, there are plenty of good systems you could choose from, that it's perfectly possible to have uh, a situation which everybody has. Uh, an insurance policy, regardless of whether they're employed or not. Universal coverage is achieved perfectly easily without a British-style uh, system of socialism, which is essentially what Britain still has in healthcare. So there's a false dichotomy when you think of this in terms of rights. But here I think I agree with you, Michael. I don't think one can discuss healthcare without appealing to some Aristotelian notion of what our community is supposed to be about. And here I do side with uh, the impulse of the president to do something about the uninsured. It cannot be acceptable morally in a meaningful community, in a real republic, that there should be people in the position that they are bankrupted by the random incidents uh, of chronic illness. And that's the situation in the United States for tens of millions of people. And it's scandalous. In your terms, in terms of virtue, it is not yeah. virtuous. Yeah. Well, and I, I would yeah. just um, echo that there's another uh, element of, of your notion of virtue, which is this notion of shared fate or linked fate, that we have pandemics, we have all kinds of public health concerns, and it's not just that it's immoral, but it also, in terms of our collective responsibility and our collective future, our grandchildren may not, in fact, be born if we have um, an epidemic that wipes out the population because we haven't provided health care for a significant percentage of it. Yeah, in the balcony. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to return to a bit more of a theoretical question, which is um, the first person brought up, John Stuart Mill. I was wondering where a uh, communist notion of justice fits into your system, because it doesn't seem to me that uh, it fits quite under utilitarianism, because it's willing to accept a uh, lower you know, sum of happiness in exchange for greater equality. But I had trouble seeing how it would fit into either of the other two poles. So I was wondering how, how your book considered that conception of justice, uh, justice is equality. Right, and you forgot to tell us your name. Oh, I'm Lewis Evans. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh huh. So, you, Lewis, you connected the communism and also equality, which I suppose would there there is a, certainly a way of connecting them, um, though there there are many traditions of equality that are that don't count as communism. So the real question would be what is the moral basis of equality from the standpoint of any given political tradition that embraces it. And there are, uh, 
the, the communist tradition is informed by a, num by a number of the strands of argument that we've been uh, discussing. Some say an ideal communist society would promote the greatest good for the greatest number, the utilitarian or scientific strand of communism. Uh, but an equally powerful strand argues in the name of freedom. And Marx himself grew out of a tradition of German philosophy that was, that was trying to work out the idea of freedom and to what extent was freedom individual and to what extent did it require a certain kind of collective life. So you're, you're right to raise the tradition of communism as a, an approach to justice. And what's interesting is how even communism draws on these, these uh, different strands. I don't know if anyone else like to take that? It's just worth bearing in mind that one of the defining characteristics of most of the regimes that came into existence uh, on the basis of communism is that they were completely unjust in the sense that there was no rule of law. Uh, and this reminds us that one of the important elements in any theory of justice and any system of law is the notion of property rights. Uh, Locke has a walk-on part in your book, too short a, an appearance for my liking, because it seems to me that any really serious understanding of, of the idea of rights has to, has to take account of the role of property rights in defining the whole tradition of law, the whole concept of justice on which this country is based, which is rooted in the English common law. Right. Um, is there, we have three microphones. Am I missing anyone up, up there, or should we? No? Oh, right here. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Noor Ibrahim. I'm a freshman in the college. Um, I, this is going back to the question about whether you should provide reparations to the African American community. And my question is that if, you, if the government holds certain responsibility for the problems that, had, that the community had to face, such as when the government al allowed for the slave trade, things like that, then, then should the government give them compensation as opposed to immigrants coming in and, and you know, expecting the government to provide them the same rights as a minority that the African American community uh, the government, that the debate is going on about the African-American community. So do you think that it's right, it's just for the government to provide compensation for one community and not another on the basis that they held responsibility for the problems of that community? And are you thinking about, uh, since immigrants have just arrived, yes. that they should yeah. not be held responsible no, for the sharing government. the burden or that they should not be recipients of They the should not be recipients. Uh, because they weren't part of the community yeah. that suffered in the injustice in yeah. the past. Yes. Well, others may, want, may have a view about it. It seems to me that if, what does it mean for an immigrant to become a member of a political community, to become a citizen? If you think of citizenship uh, as strictly a matter of individual responsibility and individual entitlements based on what you yourself have done, then it would seem the immigrant can neither be the recipient of public provision nor be held responsible for anything that he or she wasn't around to experience. But that seems to me a flawed and impoverished idea of what it means to be a citizen. When an immigrant joins a political community, he or she takes on, as a citizen, a certain past, a certain experience. The Constitution, to take the American example, and the constitutional tradition and the tribulations and the civil war, the glories and the injustices of that community become, in a way, the adopted inheritance of that new member. And if that's true, then all the notions of collective responsibility and of collective entitlement that flow from a shared citizenship in history would seem to apply in the same kind of way. The United States, I think, has understood itself 
deeply, perhaps more than European societies, is an immigrant society precisely because it's accepted the idea that immigrants share in the good and the bad of the past as well as, as the present. And without that, I think it's very hard to understand what it means to become a member, a citizen of a political community. But I, well, on the land scheme, they would benefit. I mean, they would benefit regardless of their right, if, if they were If they were poor enough. Right. Else? That we, note says, one more. time for one last question. How did you, you <laughs> must be it's, very it's long. Just, it's you, just you're like that time of good the vision. Night, that no, time no, of the no. evening. Go ahead. That's exactly what it says. Uh, hi, my name's Phil Mayer. I'm a 2L at the law school. Um, and my question is uh, about exactly what you mean uh, with virtue. Uh, and you have said that you're thinking of Aristotelian virtue at some degree, but for Aristotle that was easier because he had a very defined view of human nature and a discrete list of virtues, and so if you were debating a moral question or a question about how we should behave, you could say, well, how does it rank on these, I don't remember how many there were, virtues. And when I heard you talking about how our dialogues today are in fact about virtue, uh, when you described, for example, the gay marriage debate and you said it's not about consent versus virtue, it's about virtue versus virtue. It sounds like you're talking about, not that we're arguing about the same virtues and what, the, what results those virtues should entail, but rather that we are just talking about different virtues past each other. Uh, and so I guess my question is, is, is your conception when you say that virtue is what we should be doing as a way of getting at justice, just that it's, we should be having a dialogue and recognizing that we're talking about virtue, or are there right answers? And then the same question, uh, sort of at the international level, it, to what extent is this culturally driven and driven by the virtues of any given culture? Wow, what a question for the finale of the evening. That's, now there's a philosophical question for you. You wanted to know what philosophers do for a living. They try to wrap their minds around hard questions like that one. Good luck. <laughs> You're on your own, buddy. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, part of what gives virtue a bad name is the, is the idea that there is a fixed list and that unless you agree with that fixed list and apply it in a certain way, um, you should go to the guillotine. <laughs> it's been that, known to happen. That, it's happened historically. And any politics of virtue, any politics of the common good, consorts with that danger. I think that's a, that conception of virtue as fixed and uncontestable is a misunderstanding of what it means to engage in democratic life on questions about the best way to live. Who deserves what? What virtues are worth aspiring to? Uh, and what virtues should be embodied in public life and in law? Um, my argument would be that those arguments about virtue and about the good life, about what's worthy of honor and recognition by the political community, these are questions we can't answer if we try to be neutral and say it's just a matter of individual choice or of individual rights. So is there a single right answer? There has to be contestation and argument. That's the deliberation. And the democratic moment that Lonnie was wanting to make sure that I was including in my account of virtue, civic virtue. But and we could all go home and say, yeah, it's just a matter of agreeing to disagree. Nobody's right. There are no right answers. All that matters is that we voice our views. But I don't want to, uh, I don't think that's right, exactly. Because if we're really to have a, imagine a public life where there is serious argument and moral engagement 
about things that matter, including virtue and honor and recognition and who deserves what and how to conceive responsibility for past wrongs and injustice. I don't think we can engage in that argument unless we presuppose the possibility that some answers are better than others. Deliberation is a pale thing if it doesn't go with the idea that some people may, may be right and others may be wrong. That's why there is so much at stake in politics. Politics would be, it would be kind of like a pablum if, if it were so non-judgmental that we said, yeah, we'll argue about these things, but without any hint that there's a truth of the matter or a right answer or a better answer. And so that's why the danger, the danger of Robespierre and the guillotine and the unease about the language of virtue can never be put to rest once and for all. Politics is dangerous. It's unavoidably dangerous especially when it traffics in moral arguments. But I think there's a danger when we fail to recognize that every serious argument we make about things like health care or bailouts or same-sex marriage or reparations presuppose some moral vision, a certain account of virtue and who deserves what. So it is dangerous, and I don't want to deny that. There was uh, a famous politi political philosopher, Isaiah Berlin, who ended one of his essays by saying, a wise man once wrote, a wise man was actually an economist, Schumpeter, a wise man once wrote that to believe in the relative validity of one's convictions and yet to stand for them unflinchingly is what distinguishes a civilized man from a barbarian. It's inspiring in a way, but I think it's wrong. Because if you really believed that your deepest convictions were only relatively valid, your personal opinions, it would not only be difficult to stand for them unflinchingly, it would also be foolish. And it would be difficult to imagine from those purely relative convictions the, the vital, dangerous, contested, difficult, messy, but inescapably um, moral arguments that we have in democratic life. But here's a test. Here's a test. Every time your idea of virtue comes into conflict with my idea of individual liberty, your idea of virtue should lose. That seems to me to be the acid test. And that's how we should rank these things. That's how you keep away the guillotine. Um, I don't think so, but it's late in the evening <laughs> for that kind of <laughs> challenge. Thank you to our panelists, Lonnie, Neil, Peggy, thank you very much, and to Bill. So you're a liberal after all. The liberalism comes out at the end.